right, so um, like I said, my name's Sherry Crabtree. I'm a horticulture research and extension associate at Kentucky State University, um, which is in central Kentucky and Frankfurt, kind of between Louisville and Lexington. Um, and we work with different native fruits and nuts, but probably 90% of what I do is pawpaws. And like she said, we're actually, there's some other universities that do some research with pawpaw, but we're the only university in the world that has a full-time program devoted only to pawpaws. So that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. It's a really interesting, unique native tree fruit. So for anybody who is not familiar with pawpaws, probably a lot of you are at least somewhat familiar with them. Um, the scientific name is Asimina triloba and it is a member of the custard apple family. Ananaceae is the name of the custard apple family. And it's actually the only temperate member of that family. The rest of um, the custard apple family are all tropical and subtropical plants. Um, a lot of other fruits like cherimoya, soursop, um, sometimes just called custard apple, are in that family. Um, some of which you'll see at groceries, you know, at Kroger and Meyer and Publix. And, um, some of the more mainstream groceries, sometimes you'll see cherimoya or soursop. So pawpaw is, is the only member of that family that can grow in regions that get very cold, that get below freezing. It's a fairly slow growing, medium sized tree, has kind of a pyramidal growth habit shape. Um, the fruit are in clusters and a lot of times there are other common names for pawpaw You'll hear them called um, poor man's banana or Kentucky, banana, just depending on what state you're in, banana. And part of the reason, you know, they're in these clusters that look kind of like round bananas, um, but the fruit also have kind of a banana-like flavor. And the fruit can be quite large. If you're used to seeing wild fruit, usually they're fairly small, but improved varieties are usually around a half a pound in size, but you do see some see fruits sometimes that are up to a pound. I think the record, as far as I know, is close to two pounds, which is unusual, but they can get up to two pounds in size. So the fruit itself has this tropical, almost kind of a tutti fruity flavor and aroma. And it's really its own unique flavor, but the best way to describe it, if you haven't eaten pawpaws before, is a blend of banana and mango. And there are different varieties that have different undertones. Um, a lot of varieties you'll taste pineapple, um, coconut, um, vanilla, custard, um, sometimes a caramel flavor. Um, some varieties have a little bit of melon or cantaloupe flavor. And the base flavor is this like tropical mango banana. And the texture of the flesh is soft, similar to a ripe avocado. And sometimes it's even softer, almost like a, a custard or pudding that you can just slice the fruit open and eat it with a spoon. It is very nutritious, high in lots of vitamins, minerals, and it's high in antioxidants. So as far as kind of the cycle throughout the year of pawpaws, they flower um, in April and May in Kentucky. It's actually getting a little bit earlier. So now I think it's pretty much the month of April. Um, usually start right about the same time as dogwoods bloom is when pawpaws bloom around that same time as dogwoods. And there are both male and female parts on the same tree and the same flower. A lot of times I think people might get them confused with persimmon and think that there are male and female trees that are separate, but that's not the case with pawpaw, but they do need to cross pollinate. So there are not separate male and female trees, but they're not self-fertile. So you want to have two trees to get good cross-pollination in order to get, um, get good fruit set. And we had noticed and heard other people talk about, well, I only have one tree, but I, I still get some fruit off of it. And we had a graduate. And there is some self-pollination pawpaw, so if you only have a single tree, you'll sometimes get a few fruit off of it. But if you want to get a full crop, then you have to be crop pollinated. And another unique thing about pawpaws is they are pollinated by flies and beetles. A, a Your a audio keeps cutting out. Covered in pollen. Oh, no. Well, hopefully it holds up. I think it might be. Can you hear me okay now? All 
Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Uh, yes. I think if everyone will mute and take uh, go off video, we'll try that. Except you, of course, Sherry. <laughs> I don't know if it'd be my internet at home. Of course, yeah. keep the slides going, but turn my video off. So if it keeps cutting out, then you can turn your audio back on and let me know. So, um, so as far as pawpaws flowering, they flower over about a month long period also, um, which is unique. You know, usually peaches and apples, they'll come into full bloom and they're in full bloom for a few days and then they're done. Pawpaws flower over about a month long period, a single tree, which is good because, um, that helps them escape spring frosts and freezes. Usually you'll have um, some flowers that are still closed. If you have a frost that are more cold hardy, that you'll still get some, some fruit off of that tree. And you see on the lower right, um, you've got flowers at the bottom, a flower that hasn't opened yet, that's still in bud, a flower that's fully open, and then kind of in the background, you can see some developing fruit on the tree as well. Um, so you've got flowers of all stages and fruit developing at the same time on the same tree, which is really beneficial. Flowers to spring frost and freezes. They're also a nice part of like an edible landscape. They have a really beautiful golden yellow flower, and the flowers are also attractive. They're these kind of maroon um, bell-shaped flowers. And you mentioned the zebra swallow swallowtail butterfly, which I did not know was the state butterfly of Tennessee. So that is really good to know. Um, Papa is the exclusive host plant for the zebra swallowtail. And a lot of people with butterfly gardens will plant pawpaws in order to attract this butterfly, um, since that's the only plant that they lay eggs on and that the larva on. Um, a lot of people um, may read that the flowers aroma because they are pollinated by flies and beetles. The aroma of the flowers is not bad. Um, it's not something that you're going to smell as you're walking through your yard. If you stick your nose right in a flower, it has kind of a musky smell. But I think like the case. So you don't need to worry about the scent of the flowers. And that is the zebra swallowtail butterfly. That is the exclusive, pawpaw's exclusive host plant for that butterfly. So this is the native range of pawpaw. You see Kentucky, Tennessee, we're right in the middle of the native range. So you often see them wild out in the forest, usually in the understory of hardwood forests. And the native range ranges from northern Florida, kind of the northern Gulf Coast area, up into southern New York, southern Michigan, even a little bit into southern Ontario, Canada. So they are actually technically native to Canada too, although it's a small area. And a little bit west of the Mississippi River into eastern Kansas, Nebraska, eastern Texas, areas like that. So basically anywhere with a pretty temperate growing zone, you can grow pawpaws. The map on the right shows where they can be grown and purple is more of the native range and green is where they're able to be grown even though it's outside of the native range. So they're quite cold hardy. They're hardy to about 25 below Fahrenheit. So that's cold hardy for our area, but not quite cold hardy enough to be grown in North Dakota, Minnesota and places like that. So growing zones five to nine is what Papa is generally recommended for. It does need some chill hours. That's why it can't be grown in Southern Florida and you know, the very Southern tip of Texas or Hawaii or Mexico or places like that because it does need about 400 to 800 chill hours to go dormant in the winter time. Um, which chill hours means um, hours spent between 32 and 45 Fahrenheit, which we get in our area in winter quite easily. But somewhere like um, Miami would probably only get maybe 100 chill hours per year. So being a native plant, there's a lot of interesting history with pawpaw in the U.S. The first written record was in 1541 that Hernando de Soto, which was an early explorer from Spain, reported that Native Americans were growing and eating pawpaws in the Mississippi River Valley. And there's 
other records of Native Americans um, making pawpaws into cakes to eat, trading the seeds, using the seeds. There are, if you look at some of the areas in um, New York that are almost kind of outliers um, of the Native range, that tends to correspond to where Native American settlements were. So they definitely spread um, around, around the U.S. from Native Americans planting them in that area. Also, Lewis and Clark, you might remember from history class, were early explorers. Um, so on their trip to Oregon, they had explored to the West Coast and were on their way back from Oregon in Missouri in September of 1806. They ran out of food and had to forage for wild food. And they were able to find pawpaws growing wild and recorded on their journal that they survived on pawpaws for several days and pawpaws helped save them from starvation. And a lot of other early American people in American history, George Washington, it said that chilled pawpaw fruit was his favorite dessert. Thomas Jefferson, you might know, was kind of an amateur horticulturist. And there are letters that were preserved of him sending pawpaw seeds to France. So it, it may be possible that Thomas Jefferson introduced pawpaws to Europe. Um, Mark Twain was also reported to be a pawpaw fan. So a lot of interesting American history with the pawpaw. And native plants, so they are found in the wild. And the environment that they're usually found in in the wild is in the understory of hardwood forests. They're usually found along rivers and creeks and areas like that. And they form these large patches. You may have heard the folk song way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Um, so they form these big patches that are mostly spread by root suckers. So it may look like hundreds of trees, hundreds of stems, but they're all from one root system. And there are some mixed in there, but the predominant of the whole patch will be shoots from one root system. And that's part of the reason a lot of times they're all the same genetically. And so there's nothing different to cross pollinate with. And um, they also don't produce as many fruit in the shade. And a lot of people think that I'm gonna cut my video off for a minute because I did get a message about that my internet was not stable. So that may be why my audio is cutting out. Um, pawpaws produce more fruit in sun than in shade. So even though in the wild, naturally they are found in shady areas, they don't have to grow in the shade. They grow fine in full sun and produce more fruit in full sun. They can also grow in the shade, but they just don't produce as many fruit in the shade. There also may not be as many pollinators in, um, in the wild. Flies and beetles usually just don't fly as far or are as active as bees. And so there may just not be as many pollinators or traveling as long a distance. And often the fruit in these wild patches is um, poor quality. They can be small, have a lot of seeds, sometimes have off flavors to them. But there are some things that you can do to help manage wild pawpaw patches to improve fruit set. You can thin them out, just choose the trees that look the healthiest and the strongest that are about eight feet apart or so and um, kind of thin them out so they're not overcrowded. You can also prune or clear out um, surrounding trees that are shading the pawpaws to let more light in. So they'll get more fruit set with more sunlight. And also anything that's competing with them in the underbrush. Um, a lot of times you'll find bush honeysuckle that's an invasive species in the same environment as pawpaw. It's kind of the same. And so if you clear things like be competing for water and nutrients as well. And as far as the cross pollination, you can bring in seedlings or grafted trees um, from somewhere else to increase diversity and you'll have something genetically different to cross pollinate with. You could also, instead of bringing in a tree and planting it, you could also graft some of those root suckers that are right there in the patch to, um, to bring in genetic diversity and also to graft something that's higher fruit quality. 
And a lot of people ask about digging and transplanting the root suckers. They are hard to transplant because they, um, being part of that one root system, they kind of have a runner root that's attached to the mother tree and they don't have a lot of a root system of their own and they do have a tap root, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, but um, the main tree has a tap root and the, the small root suckers a lot of times just have kind of a runner root. But if you go around that, a cut around the root sucker that you're wanting to transplant with a shovel and sever that, but leave it in the ground for another year and don't disturb it, but it will, since it's been cut with a shovel, it'll develop a little bit more of its own root system. And then the next year you can dig that and transplant it is the best way to do that. I'm gonna try my video again, but. Okay, so being a native plant, a wild plant, through a lot of history, pawpaw has been wild harvested, just go out and forage and collect wild fruit, which is still done today. But there have been a lot of efforts to breed new improved pawpaws. And it started way back over a hundred years ago. So in 1916, there was the best pawpaw contest that was sponsored by the American Genetics Association. And they predicted that if there was intelligent breeding of pawpaws, that a commercial industry would begin with pawpaw. But we see that hasn't really happened. They're definitely more popular now than they were. of um, fruit and vegetable production in the U.S. is based on being able to store a long time and ship long distances. You know, so much fruit is, is grown in California and Mexico and Florida and then shipped all around the country. And you just can't do that with pawpaw. It, just, it bruises too easily and is very perishable. So that's a big part of the reason that a big commercial industry has not developed. And there was kind of a lull. So there is this early, you know, 1916, 19. was founded in 1988. And then we began our pawpaw research program at KSU in 1990 and the Ohio Pawpaw Festival, which is a big, um, a big festival that's held in Athens, Ohio, began in 1999, which is still going on today. And the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Foundation was founded, which then turned into the North American Pawpaw Growers Foundation. So all of that has kind of happened, you know, in the 90s to the early 2000s till today, there's been a lot of new growing interest in pawpaw. So some of the main goals of our program at KSU are preserving and evaluating genetic diversity in pawpaw. Quite a bit of varieties. Um, orchard management recommendation is just kind of how to grow them best. And we work, pretty much anybody that has any questions about wanting to grow pawpaws, whether they are have an orchard or you know, a farmer or just somebody that wants a few trees in their backyard, we're glad to help and answer any questions that you have about pawpaw production. And we've also done some work um, trying to develop post-harvest storage methods of a short shelf life, and then things like recipes and value-added products. So if you'd like to grow pawpaws, um, that has good air or good air drainage. You don't want to plant in the lowest lying areas because um, cold air is denser or heavier than warm air. And so when we have frost in the spring, which I don't know about you all in Tennessee, but we had everything came, it got warm, everything came into bloom early. And then we had some temperatures in the low twenties um, about three weeks ago, I guess, um, that killed a lot of peach, peach blooms. So cold air being denser and heavier settles in low lying areas. So you don't want to plant your trees in the most low-lying area. 
And it can be surprising, you can see um, this photo shows our orchard at the KSU farm. The low-lying areas, when we have these spring frosts or freezes, you can lose, um, you know, lose quite a few developing fruit and flowers. And then you just go up the hill and it's just, a, it's a, it can be a few degrees difference, but you'll have a full crop at the top of the hill and hardly any crop at the bottom of the hill. So you definitely don't wanna be in the most low-lying areas. And pawpaws do like um, a deep, fertile, well-drained soil with a lot of organic matter and a slightly acid to neutral pH. And you do want to have some type of weed control. They don't compete very well having a lot of grass and weeds and things around the trees. Um, so mulch, wood chip mulch or straw mulch helps keep weeds down and also helps conserve moisture in the soil. Um, if you just got a few trees, just pulling the weeds, hoeing around the tree, large orchards, you can use glyphosate for weed control. They need quite a bit of water. So you wanna make sure that you keep the trees well watered or if you're planting an orchard that you have irrigation that you put in especially the first couple of years. Um, they do have a taproot, so they will go down pretty deep, but the first couple of years that they're getting established, they need a fair amount of moisture. You don't want them to dry out. And then they need about an inch of rain per week minimum. And it's good to do soil tests before you plant, uh, just to see if you're deficient in any nutrients and your county extension agent can help you with soil testing. But generally, the soil um, requirements are about the same as other fruits, um, you know, similar to apple as far as the nutrient requirements. You also want to choose a site with at least part sun. They produce more fruit and full sun. And very small seedlings, though, if you um, are starting to feed yourself, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, they do need some protection from the sun the first couple of years. But once they're a foot and a half tall, they can handle being in full sun. Under a foot and a half tall, they do need um, some kind of temporary shade, a shade around them, a tree tube or something like that, or just have them in a pot and have them sitting somewhere shady and then, you know, plant them out in full sun when you're ready for them to be in their permanent spot. And recommended spacing between trees is eight to 10 feet between trees. And you don't wanna go any farther than 30 feet apart. Um, eight to 10 feet is what we do when they're in rows, like an orchard. But if you're using at your house and you want you know, one on each end of your house to you know, kind of flank, flank your house just for um, your landscape design, you don't want them to be any farther than 30 feet apart just for pollination. Pollination gets, gets worse when they're farther apart than that. And in an orchard, we do 18 to 20 feet between the rows. And you can plant the trees for fall. So as far as maintaining the trees, you can prune pawpaws similar to an apple tree. And in early spring, we after the coldest part of winter is over, but before they start growing in the spring. And it's kind of up to you how you want to prune them. So we did, did a little experiment looking at pruning them to a central leader, which is how you prune an apple tree versus leaving them unpruned. And the photo, um, photo on the top left, shows on the left, a tree, a pawpaw tree that's pruned similar to an apple tree, the tree on the right, was left unpruned. And you see the unpruned tree has a lot, you know, kind of a bushy growth habit, limbs a lot closer to the ground. So most of it is really just how you want the tree to look. If you like the more bushy shrubby appearance versus having, having more of a trunk, a single trunk growing up. Um, just for maintenance, it's a lot easier to mow around the tree and pick fruit on the tree that is pruned to a central leader. Um, but there's not, otherwise there's not a ton of benefits one way or the other. The yields were actually a little bit higher on the trees that were left unpruned, but it was really just because you're leaving more. 
branch out. I have to make it any, any weaker or less healthy to prune it. So just kind of what, you know, however you want them to look if you like a more naturalized appearance. And again, irrigation, you want to go for at least an inch of water per week. And drip irrigation is always good. Or if you're, if you just got a couple of trees and you're hand watering, just leave, leave the hose on a little bit of a trickle to slowly water. So it gets watered nice and deep um, for that tap root. So fertilization, we use urea. You can also, pretty much any source of nitrogen is fine. So in our orchards, we use urea. We've used Peters or miracle Grow on potted trees in the greenhouse. But we, we've also used Nature Safe, which is a bone feather blood meal on organic pawpaw trees. So really any kind of fertilizer is fine as long as it has some nitrogen. You do wanna stop that by August 1st because you don't want them actively growing when they need to be starting to shut down for the fall. So this is one issue that we see um, with pawpaw trees in our orchard is southwest injury or sun scald. And this happens in the winter time when the trees are dormant. The sun shines strongest on the southwest side of the tree. And when they're dormant, um, you know, it's cold, they're kind of shut down for the winter and the sun shines on that side and the bark being a little bit darker absorbs the heat, absorbs the light and it warms up on that side and the sap kind of starts flowing, then it gets cold again. And it's kind of a freeze thaw cycle that can cause cracking of the trunk, which you see in the bottom photo, bottom center. So if you paint trunks white, and this is two thirds white latex paint and one third water to thin it out, or um, people use lime to whitewash trees sometimes, or like a light colored trunk wrap that works the same way. And that reflects the sunlight and will prevent the temperature extremes and prevent the trunk from cracking. And I'm sorry, I see some comments that you could not hear during the, um, the pruning part. Um, and we can, yeah, have any questions at the end, but basically what I said was that they can be pruned similar to an apple tree to a central leader, or if you leave them unpruned, they have more of this bushy growth habit. So it's kind of personal preference. And um, somebody asked if shrubs casting shade on the trunk would be okay. You don't want anything planted too close to the trees to be a lot of competition for water and nutrients. Some things casting shade on the trunk that would actually help prevent the Southwest injury also. So this is one issue we see with pawpaws. Overall, pawpaws are easy to grow. They're pretty, um, pretty free of disease and insect pests, especially compared to apple and peach and a lot of things that you almost have to have to spray unless you get very disease resistant cultivars. There's not a lot of diseases that bother pawpaw. And um, this is one that we see. You probably would not have much problem with this if you only have a few trees. It's more we have orchards with you know thousands of trees and so we have a lot of inoculum built up but this is a fungal spot that you see on the leaves and the fruit um, it's worse in years that it's wet which is always the case with fungal diseases because they need leaf wetness for the fungal spores to grow and so you see the black spots on the leaves and it also can cause black spots on the fruit which the fruit on the the bottom center photo that has just black spots on the skin. If you cut that fruit open, it will be fine on the inside. It doesn't cause a rot or anything on the inside. So it's mostly cosmetic. However, when it gets really bad cases of it, like you see the fruit on the right, it can cause the skin to crack because basically the black spots kind of make the skin brittle. And then as the fruit grows and expands, then it will crack. So you don't want to let this get out of control if you have it. Um, we did look at using sulfur and copper to control this and didn't have a lot of success. Um, but we had a student look at mancocide, which is mancozeb, which is a fungicide and copper fungicide that worked well. And also some varieties are more resistant than others. Um, sunflower tends to be a little bit more susceptible to it. 
As far as insect pests, there are not a lot that you will see. There is this Asimina webworm moth that has, uh, it builds nests kind of in the branch angles and at the tips of branches, similar to fall webworm. Usually you don't see a lot of these. We've actually never seen any of these at our farm, but there is a grower that we work with in Eastern Kentucky that gets these quite a bit. I think it's because he's a little bit closer to wooded areas. Usually you can just remove these manually, just cut out the nests and destroy them. Um, something like BT would work against them since they are a caterpillar. There's also the pawpaw peduncle borer, which is also a moth larva. And the peduncle is a little stem that attaches the flower to the tree. And that's how it got its name is originally it was found the larva would burrow into that little stem of the flower and make the flower shrivel up and drop off the tree. But um, it's also found in other parts. It's got multiple generations per year. So it will get into the fruit and you see um, this brown powder coming out of the fruit in the center photo is frass. So that's droppings from the insect, the larva that's inside the fruit. It will also burrow into the small twigs. But I will say it's low numbers of this. We've done counts in our orchard and found them in three to 5% of the fruit. So that's not a threshold that you would worry about um, spraying or applying insecticides for. There's also a pawpaw sphinx moth that looks similar to a tobacco hornworm or a tomato hornworm. And again, this is very rare. We've seen these once or twice in our orchards. Japanese beetles do not prefer pawpaws. They will feed on the leaves somewhat, but they very much prefer grapes and blackberries and plums and peaches and just about everything else over pawpaws. What's a bigger problem is animal pests. Raccoons, possums really love pawpaw fruit and they will eat fruit that drops on the ground. We'll talk about that in a minute that um, when pawpaw fruit are ripe, they'll fall on the ground and you'll find, I think they like to sample them to try to find the ones that taste the best to them because you'll find fruit on the ground with like one bite taken out of each fruit um, and see the little raccoon mouth prints on them. And if they want them bad enough, they will climb the trees, but generally they only eat the fruit that drops on the ground. Deer are not much of a problem with pawpaws. Um, we do have deer at our research farm and we don't find them feeding on the leaves or the fruit either one. I have heard had some people say that they will eat the fruit. So I think it depends on how much food is around, how much other stuff is around that they might prefer. They do like to rub their antlers on the trees. If the trees are kind of small to medium size, they like to rub on them. So as far as protecting the trees, um, for deer, some kind of fencing is always best. Raccoons and possums, it's hard to keep them out with an electric fence. So really just harvesting them to beat them to the fruit, you know, get the fruit before they can get to it or before the fruit falls on the ground is the best way to do that. So if you want to grow your own pawpaws, you can start them yourself from seed. Um, say you eat a fruit, you know, it tastes good. You want to grow some yourself. Take the seed out of the fruit, clean it you want to put it in something to stay moist. So we store ours in damp peat moss in plastic bags. You can just wrap them up in a damp paper towel or damp newspaper or something like that. And then they need to go in the refrigerator for at least a hundred days. So you don't wanna allow the seeds to dry out. A lot of seeds, um, you dry them in order to store them, but papa, they will not germinate if you let them dry out. Even if they sit out to open air for a few days or a week, the germination goes down quite a bit. And they're also killed if you store them in the freezer, which is a little bit confusing because some seeds will survive outside in the winter, which obviously gets below freezing. So seed will tolerate a little bit of freezing apparently since some of them survive in the wild. But if you store them in the freezer, then that will kill them. So I think it's either the temperatures being lower or being below freezing 24 seven for several months. You know, it's either the time or the temperature. I think, you know, they'll survive maybe some brief 
going down below freezing overnight and then warming up again the next day in the wild. But anyway, don't store seed in the freezer is, is the main point of that. You wanna store them in the refrigerator. And they do have a deep tap root. So if you start them in pots, you wanna make sure that you're using a deep pot. Um, we use these tree pots that are 14 inches deep. You can start them in, um, you know, something like milk cartons or two liter bottles or something like that with holes poked in the bottom. If you want kind of a more do it yourself or recycle things at home. However, if you, if you start them from seed, know that pawpaws are not true to type from seed. So if you have a fruit that you really like and you save the seed out of it, it's not going to be identical to the parent tree. It's a cross of the two parents. And if the two parents are good, then the seedling is likely to have good fruit. But if you just collect wild seed, then it may not be the best quality fruit that you get from the seedling. It does take quite a while. It takes seven to eight years to produce fruit for the tree to get big enough to produce fruit when you grow up from seed. So since seedlings are not tree to type, they're not identical to the parents, how can you propagate pawpaws, um, what we call clonally, so it'll be identical to the parent. Um, pawpaws will not root from cuttings, unfortunately, if you take cuttings and treat them with you know, rooting powder, rooting hormone, and stick them in soil or water, they will not produce roots. Um, layering, there's different types of layering, like air layering, that does not work well with pawpaws. So pawpaws are propagated by grafting and budding, which um, some of you all may be familiar with, with other fruit trees, peaches and apples are generally also propagated by grafting and budding. So that is onto a seedling rootstock. So you basically, you grow a pawpaw up from seed until it's about two years old is the right size to graft when it's about the diameter of a pencil. And then you take a cutting, either a single bud or a little stick with about you know three or four buds on it and you graft that onto the seedling. And there are different methods you can use. I'm not sure if any of you all have ever grafted before, but you can use chip budding, which is where you just cut a single bud off of the tree you're wanting to propagate and graft that onto the seedling, which is what you see. Um, the bigger photo in the middle is a chip bud. You can also use a grafting tool, which the photos you see at the bottom are using a grafting tool that make kind of a V-shaped cut that you then fit together and wrap up with grafting tape or parafilm. Um, so that heals together and comes the new tree, essentially. You can also do this on bigger trees. It's called bark inlay grafting. And that's what you see in the photo, the bottom right. Um, it works better when they're not too, you know, if they're five or six inches diameter, then that's too big. But if it's, um, you yeah, know, about two to three inch diameter tree, you can cut that down to a stump and cut kind of a flap on the side of that trunk and stick the piece of cyanwood wood you make, again, kind of a V-shaped cut and stick that into the flap. And it will eventually, it's a little bit hard to see in that photo, but it will heal over the, the trunk. It has to be staked for a few years, but if you have a seedling, a wild tree that doesn't have good fruit and um, it's a bigger size like that, you actually can graft those. And one advantage to grafted trees is they only take three to four years to produce fruit compared to seedlings that take seven to eight years. But the main reason that we do this is to propagate them true to type, since when you propagate them by seed, it's, um, you know, it'll be across the two parents, which that's the case with other fruits too. So, you know, if you like honey crisp apples, but you save seed out of the honey crisp apple that you got at the grocery store, it's not gonna be honey crisp, but will be a cross of honey crisp and whatever pollinated it to produce that fruit. And a lot of people don't realize that there are named pawpaw cultivars, just like there's, I mentioned honey crisp apple and gala apple. There are also named varieties of pawpaw that have improved quality, you know, larger fruit, higher yields. And again, pawpaw is not true to type from seed. Sometimes the seedlings have poor quality, although if they have good parents, they're likely to be good quality and they do take longer to flower and fruit. And so we'll go through some pawpaw cultivars that are recommended for this area. And um, we've done quite a few variety trials um, 
at KSU. And again, we've done breeding also. So the first few that I'll mention are some that we, the result of our breeding program at KSU. Um, KSU Atwood was the first one that we released in 2008. It's got kind of a mango flavor, a little bit more of an orange colored flesh. And it's a little bit later ripening. So usually mid-September for us, you're a little bit farther south, so it would be a little bit earlier for you, but it's usually about the middle of September that Atwood ripens. And when I talk about early or late ripening, it's not as big a range as apples or peaches. You know, apples, you may have summer apples that get ripe in July, and then you'll have apples all the way up until October. With pawpaw, it's still kind of the mid-September to the end of or mid-August to the end of September is, is the range for those. KSU Benson was the next variety that we released. And you can see it has a really nice round shape. It's almost like a baseball or softball shaped fruit. Really good flavor. Again, kind of a little bit darker yellow orange flesh and good yields, good fruit size. KSU Chappelle is our most recent variety that we released from KSU. Oh, and I should mention that Benson is earlier ripening. So that starts in late September for us in Kentucky, which again might be about a week earlier for you all if you're since you're farther south. And KSU Chappelle kind of fits in the middle. It's the first week of September here in Kentucky. It's very vigorous. The trees fast growing, high yielding, has kind of a banana pineapple flavor, and also has a low percent seed, which is the case for others also. We try to breed for have a lower seed content. So these are some older varieties that we also recommend based on variety trials that we had um, in C1, which um, has large fruit, good yields, overlease. Again, has more of that round shaped fruit. Overlease has kind of a melon or cantaloupe flavor. So if you like cantaloupe, overlease would be a good one to try. Sunflower is also a good variety. It has a pretty mild flavor. And a lot of times we kind of jokingly call those beginners pawpaws because um, a lot of times when people haven't eaten a lot of pawpaws before, they like the milder flavored fruit more. People that are bigger pawpaw fans tend to like the ones that have a little bit more intense, strongly flavored fruit. Neil Peterson, um, Peterson Pawpaws is the name of his company. He's another pawpaw breeder in West Virginia. And he actually got a lot of his material. I mentioned a lot of those cultivars being lost from like the 40s and 50s. And he went back to some of those old abandoned orchards and got seeds from those. And that's where his breeding material came from. So um, pretty much any of his pawpaw varieties are also good and are recommended for this area. Um, Potomac is the largest Papa fruit that we've had in our trial. Shenandoah is another one that has a little bit more mild flavor. Wabash is another one of those with the very round shaped fruit, kind of a dark orange color. And Susquehanna is one that I really like. It wins a lot of taste tests. We've done some taste tests both at our events and the Ohio Pawpaw Festival has a best pawpaw competition. And Susquehanna has won that several times. And the only drawback to Susquehanna, you see it has a little bit fewer fruit per tree, but um, it still has plenty of fruit to get a good crop off of. And as far as where to buy pawpaw trees, um, there may be some other smaller nurseries local to your area that I don't know about, but these are some that I'm familiar with that all of these we actually work with too. So our KSU varieties, Atwood, Benson and Chappelle, all of these nurseries um, will sell those varieties also. So there's a couple in Tennessee and then a couple in Kentucky. And we do have a nursery list on our website that has a longer list of nurseries that sell pawpaw trees. And I'm not sure about Tennessee, the Kentucky Division of Forestry sells pawpaw seedlings, like bundles of pawpaw seedlings. And I think Tennessee Division of Forestry might also. So we're continuing to do more breeding. So we're wanting to um, breed varieties. Of course, flavor is most important, yields. Um, we'd like disease resistance, early ripening, 
um, some that turn a more yellow color when they're ripe, things like that. So we've got a lot of seedlings that we've we've done crosses and then planted those seedlings out that we're going to be evaluating over the next few years. So pawpaw harvest, I think I saw a question pop up about the um, how do you know when to pick them? So unfortunately, it's a little bit hard to tell by looking at them because the skin usually stays green even when they're ripe. It will have a little bit of a color break, some of them more so than others. Some of them will turn kind of a yellow green when they're ripe, but sometimes they're still, you know, basically green when they're ripe. So the two best ways to tell, the fruit will drop on the ground when they're ripe. And so you can let them fall and pick them up off the ground, um, even though, you know, that's at risk for animals getting them and they do bruise sometimes when they fall on the ground. But as long as they're not damaged, you can pick them up and wash them and use them. But you can hand harvest and they will be soft, similar to how a peach feels soft when it's ripe. And it will also come off easily in your hand when you pick. So if you um, feel the fruit, it's a little bit soft and you kind of give it a gentle pull, give it a wiggle and just a gentle pull and it will come off in your hand when it's ready to pick. They do bruise easily, so the bottom picture is kind of what not to do. You don't want to have them in a box or a bushel basket stacked really deep because the ones in the bottom will be bruised. Um, I think I have this on, on a later slide, but I will mention as far as hand harvesting, you they will ripen off the tree if they're starting to get a little bit soft, but if they're hard as a rock, if they're completely hard, they will not ripen off the tree. They have to be at least beginning the ripening process in order to ripen off the tree. So you can pick them when they're just starting to get a tiny bit soft, but they're not quite ready to eat at that point and let them sit for a few days and it will ripen. But again, not completely hard or it won't ripen. And we talked about how they flower over about a three to four week period. So by the same token, harvest even on the same tree is over about a three to four week period. And in Kentucky, that runs late August through late September. And again, if you're warmer, if we're in zone six, if you're in zone seven, it may be more you know, mid-August to mid-September instead of late August to late September. So when they're fully ripe, the shelf life is only a couple of days, really. They don't last long at all. Um, but again, I, I mentioned that on the last slide, you can pick them when they're just starting to get a little bit soft. You can keep them in the refrigerator and they can store for a couple of weeks in the fridge at that point. But freezing them is the best way to store them long term. And whether you're processing them to freeze or you're just eating them, um, these are some things to look out for. If they're badly bruised, a lot of times that turns bitter. There's also this red or pink discoloration that we see in the fruit sometimes, not very often, but it's kind of a heat damage response inside of the fruit. And also watch out for those larvae, the fruit borer larvae, which you don't see often, but you don't wanna accidentally eat one. The skin is bitter. I've heard a few people say that they just take bites out of them like you would eat an apple, but I would not do that. The skin is quite bitter. It's, it's thin, so it's not like a banana that you would peel but it does have a bitter flavor to it. And the seeds are not edible. The seeds actually have alkaloid compounds in them that will cause vomiting. So um, you can see the size of the seeds. They're about the size of a lima bean and they're hard. So you're not going to accidentally eat a seed if you're just eating fresh fruit. Um, so that's not, not a big concern, but when it could be a concern is if you're making a puree, like if you're pureeing it to freeze or you're making ice cream or a milkshake or something, you don't want to accidentally get a seed in the blender or the food processor. So to freeze the fruit, if you've only got a couple of trees, you have a small amount of fruit to process, you can do it by hand. And the main things, you want to remove the skin and remove the seeds. And the easiest way to do that, we cut them in half and scoop out the insides and put them in a colander or in a mesh bag. So you push it through the colander or squeeze it through the mesh bag to remove the seeds. If you've got a few more to process, you know, you need to up scale up a little bit. Um, these food mills do work well for Papa. Um, this brand is Roma, but there's Squeezo and Victorinox and several brands that are kind of the same design 
a food mill or processor. And we use the middle size screen, which is the pumpkin squash screen. And we use um, the red spiral is called a grape spiral. And it does need to be modified to use in pawpaws. You need to cut off the last two spirals. So it's wide enough for the pawpaw seeds to pass through because it's made to make grape jelly to remove grape seeds, which obviously are a lot smaller than pawpaw seeds, but it's the same process of you still need to cut the fruit in half or you can peel them with a knife and remove the peel and then put it in the food mill to remove the seeds. This is what we use now. This is more of a commercial piece of equipment. So if you're just doing this at home, this wouldn't be something that you would need, but we there's a distillery and a brewery that we work with that have bought one of these units. It's very similar to the food mill, a big souped up version of it. You still, unfortunately, you still have to peel them or cut them in half and scoop them out. There's not a good method of kind of a mechanized way to remove the skin. Um, blanching it and slipping it off doesn't work well because it still wants to stick to the fruit. But anyway, this machine, um, once you remove the peel, it's got um, kind of rubber paddles inside that tumble it around and push it through a screen. And so the seeds come out one side and the pureed pulp comes out the other side. So that's what we currently use. And it's a lot easier to do this with, with larger fruit. If you've ever had small pawpaw fruit, you know, they're mostly seed. So the bigger the fruit, you know, the better fruit to seed ratio there is. And you can store this in the refrigerator for a couple of years. You want to thaw it um, in the refrigerator so it's not exposed to air and turns brown and doesn't get heated when it's um, thawing. And then you can use that in ice cream, smoothies, baked goods, things like that, which we'll go through. As far as nutritional information for pawpaw, it's pretty similar to banana. So you see the calories, protein, um, carbohydrate content are all fairly similar to banana, which makes some sense since it has kind of a banana-like flavor. As far as where to either buy pawpaw fruit if you're looking where to buy it, or if you've got fruit that you want to sell, where can you sell it? Um, with it having such a short shelf life, generally this is at you know, farmer's markets and kind of local produce markets are the main places that you will see fresh pawpaw fruit for sale. There are some people that do online mail order sales, which um, they can charge quite a bit more, but it's tricky to package them so they don't get bruised badly, but that's another market for them. Restaurants, wineries, and breweries are some of the main markets for pawpaw fruit, especially in Kentucky. I think breweries and wineries and distilleries buy just about all the fruit that they can from pawpaw growers in the state. So, And that is one of the main products that you see on the market. And pawpaw ice cream is really good. If you've never had pawpaw ice cream, you need to try it. And I always thought that would be the first big kind of mainstream pawpaw product on the market but it has turned out to be more of these, um, you know, alcohol products. So um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of any places in Tennessee, but there are several wineries, breweries, distilleries in Kentucky, North Carolina, Ohio, Indiana that I know of. I can't think of any in Tennessee though. Um, but yeah, Papa wine, Papa brandy, Papa beer have all become, you know, pretty popular kind of seasonal fall products that you see. As far as baked goods, really anything that you make with banana, you can substi substitute pawpaw for in like a banana bread or muffin recipe, but it's also really good in custard and creme brulee and things like that since pawpaws have that creamy texture to them that lends themselves to recipes like that. And usually, you know, you, pawpaws are sweet. You think of them being in desserts and sweet things, but you can also do um, salsa recipes. You see mango and papaya salsas. You can substitute pawpaw in those recipes. And also things like barbecue sauce and hot sauce. You sometimes see, you know, like a mango habanero hot sauce that you can substitute pawpaw for the mango. Like I said, pawpaw ice cream is my personal favorite in this is the recipe that we use. So this is a recipe that we developed at KSU. It's very simple, doesn't have eggs where you have to make a custard or anything like that. 
And this recipe makes a gallon. So if you're using one of those small, um, like home countertop ice cream makers, you would want to scale it down a little bit. It's also good, just milkshakes, smoothies, things like that. I personally think it's like it better in things that are uncooked like this. I think when you make the bread, things like that, they're good, but the flavor is not quite the same after it's heated and baked. So I really like the, the ice cream and milkshakes to me are the best. Pawpaw jam is also another good way to use pawpaw fruit. And this is another recipe that we developed at KSU. And we taste tested a bunch. You see at the bottom right, all the different types that we taste tested. Some of them were made more like apple butter that had a lot of spices in it. But what people liked the best was one that was really simple that didn't have anything, any different flavors or spices added to it, just the pawpaw and some sugar and then the the fruit fresh or citric acid and pectin added to it. So I do wanna mention if you are interested in learning more about pawpaws, this is our website, kysupawpaw.com. And I mentioned there being a nursery list. So there is a nursery list on that website and also some fact sheets that we've published, things like that. If you're on Facebook, you can look for KSU Papa on Facebook and on YouTube, we have an old channel that's KSU Papa that we have some videos on. Um, but yeah, I wanted to move on to the next slide because actually our newer one um, on this third Thursday flyer, which was actually from last year's third Thursday, but KYSU Ag is um, KSU's College of Agriculture Facebook page. And that's actually where our newer videos are is on that page. But I did want to mention our third Thursday thing. So if you're not familiar with it, you're probably not being in Tennessee, but the third Thursday of every month, we have a workshop on a different topic in agriculture at our research farm, which is in Frankfurt. And every month, except December, um, April, I think is farmer's markets. Um, May, I believe is aquaculture, but September is always pawpaw. So if you wanna make the trip up to Frankfurt, that's September 21st this year is our pawpaw third Thursday thing. It's free of charge. You don't have to register ahead of time. Lunch is included. There'll be speakers um, talking on different topics about pawpaws. If we have fruit at that time, we will have a fruit tasting, um, but that's sometimes kind of hit or miss if we have any fruit at that time. Um, orchard tours, things like that. But it's also live streamed on the KSU College of Agriculture Facebook page. So if you can't make it, you can watch the videos on Facebook and the old ones are still on there. It's also National Pawpaw Day. They had that day, um, the third Thursday of September, certified officially as National Pawpaw Day, which was pretty, pretty neat. So I know there's been some questions in chat that I can answer. I might risk turning my video on and I don't know. If I start cutting out, let me know. I'm sorry that I must have had a bad, um, bad connection, but I can go through, um, through the questions and anybody. I see Bill has his hand up, so you can go ahead and if you have a question while oh, okay. I look at that. In, in my fruit, the number of the quality of pollination tells how big the fruit is. So I get these little round ones when I have two or four seeds. But if I get a whole passel, they look pretty much like your uh, yours do. What determines the size? I think some of your varieties don't have a lot of seeds in them. If you don't have many seeds, what makes the size? Well, you're right that um... Kind of as far as like plant development, seeds seeds do kind of control the fruit growing. So yeah, if you only have a couple of seeds, then usually the fruit doesn't develop very well. And that's when you get kind of those peanut shaped fruit too. Like you'll have two seeds and then have kind of a fruit that's shaped like a peanut because it develops around the seed. Basically, it's just um, fruit that are genetically larger and it's a lower percent seed, but it's not that there's fewer seed, it's just that the fruit is bigger is basically what it is. So it's um, probably not quite right to say that we're breeding for, we're breeding for a lower percent seed, but not necessarily fewer seeds because usually they have 
they have just as many seeds, but just the fruit around it is bigger. And that's just a genetic thing. They're just predisposed to, to produce larger fruit. But yes, it is true that you need to get pollination and like seed development in the fruit for the fruit to develop properly. I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you uh, cross pollinate by hand? Yes, you can hand pollinate. And we actually have a video on our Facebook page um, that talks, or not on Facebook, on our YouTube channel oh, that okay. talks about that. But, but yes, if you um, have trouble with pollination, and we don't have any trouble with ours, but I know sometimes if you just have a couple of trees, then right, right. you may have issues with pollination. So yes, you want to, I don't know if I can get back to some of the pictures with the flowers. Um, but you basically just go to a flower that is shedding pollen and you can tell because they get kind of light and powdery looking in the middle when they're shedding pollen. So it's pretty apparent. So this, this flower here is shedding pollen, although it's kind of in the later stages when it first starts and the pollen is the best, it would be a little bit lighter than that. But you see how it gets kind of loose and the pollen starts to shed. Okay. So Great. you can collect the pollen on um, a Q-tip or a little paintbrush, like one of those small watercolor paintbrushes, and take it to, I don't think I have any pictures of a flower that's quite good enough, um, but when they're receptive to being pollinated, it's actually earlier than the stage. It's when the flowers are more freshly opened. In the middle where you see that little kind of green dot right in the middle of the pollen is the stigma of the flower, and it'll look kind of shiny, like glistening almost, and that's when it's receptive to pollen. Okay. But it's when the flowers are kind of newly opened is when they're receptive. So yeah, you can hand pollinate, take pollen from one tree to another. And that's another thing, like if you have a single tree um, by itself, go to your neighbor's house or to a park or something like that, and you can collect pollen and hand pollinate your tree to get around needing to, to cross pollinate. Yeah, we just have two trees. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. So there are some questions in chat. Somebody asked, they have trees they planted over 10 years ago. They're only two feet tall. Um, that is unusual. I mean, they are slow growing, but they should grow faster than that. So 10, 10 years ago, they should be, yeah, at least eight or nine feet tall. So if they're in the shade, that's part of the reason that they're growing slower. But even so, I think it's stunted in some way. So I don't know if it could be that the soil is shallow, if there's rocky soil, we get that in Kentucky a lot. We have limestone, like huge limestone rocks that sometimes make the soil shallow that you can't see, but you know, three feet below the soil, there's a big limestone rock. But with them being only two feet tall in 10 years, I almost think it's more of a genetic thing that they just are kind of, kind of stunted or kind of runts, but the other things that, yeah, could factor into it are a poor soil, you know, whether it's a shallow soil or doesn't have a lot of nutrients, not getting enough water and being in the shade can all make them slow growing too, but that's unusually slow growing, um, even taking all that into account. Okay, let me scroll, scroll down. Yeah, somebody said they planted some four years ago. They're eight to 12 feet tall. Um, Yes, the zebra swallow, swallow tail butterfly is the one that you see on the bottom right. Okay, yeah, some discussion about papa being an understory tree. They, they will grow, um, you know, again, that's where they're found in the wild, but they produce more fruit the more sun they get, basically. So it's, they're fine to have if you have a shady area that you want a tree that will grow in the shade, but they just won't produce as many fruit in areas like that. And if anybody has any other questions, you can speak up, but I'm, I'm kind of going through the chat. A lot of them are just comments, I think, or answering other people's questions. So if I don't answer yours, then just um, holler at me. Um, And yes, papa has a tap root. There's some discussion of that. And yeah, sometimes when they're small, the roots will be, when we plant them in those pots that are 14 inches deep, by the time they're, the seedling comes up a few inches tall, the roots already to the bottom of the pot. So yeah, they, 
the root grows really quickly. And yes, they will sometimes grow through the bottom of the pot. Um, let's see. I have it's, another question. Yeah, go ahead. So the zebra swallowtail, uh, the it, the papa is its host uh, tree. How do I tell the difference between the um, a larvae? Are they do they? How do I tell the difference between that larvae and that um, damaging webworm that we have had on our pawpaw tree? Well, they look um, look quite different. Let me go back to the um, webworm. So that's yeah. what the fall webworm looks like. The zebra swallowtail is more of a fat green caterpillar that you see. Um, in the spring, you see more in kind of the late summer, the webworm, the um, zebra swallowtail, I should get some pictures of it. It looks more like the pawpaw sphinx moth, but it doesn't look exactly like it. But anyway, it's a fat, it's a fat green caterpillar. So it's not going to be confused with the Sisemina webworm and also doesn't make a web like that would be okay. another way that you All could right. tell the difference. So, so they look, look quite different. It's, you know, a fat green caterpillar and it's um, you know, it kind of takes bites out of leaves. Um, again, it doesn't look really like the Papa Sphinx, but it's more in that um, okay. Thank you. kind of genre. Yeah, more of the fat green caterpillar. Um, and they can, you know, butterflies are nice, so I wouldn't want to kill them. If they're on a really small tree, they can eat a lot of the leaves, but what I do is just take or what we've done before is take them off of the really small tree and put them on a bigger tree. Mm -hmm. All um, right. So I ask where you can get seedlings to graft onto. And yeah, some of the they ordered some bare root seedlings from their county soil and water plant sale. So you do see, sometimes see them somewhere like that. Um, so yeah, any pawpaw seedling you can graft onto. So if you can get any from the state division of forestry, or if your county has, you know, soil conservation has a plant sale or an Arbor Day sale or somewhere like that is a lot of times you can get lower price seedlings or start them yourself from seed or a lot of nurseries sell pawpaw seedlings. Um, also, they don't just sell grafted trees. And yeah, some discussion about um, them being soft when they're right. Um, somebody said, what about the new 3, 3G variety? Um, I'm not sure if that's one that you taste at one of our tastings. We have one that is, well, it has a different name than that. It's HI3120. But anyway, we have these numbered selections and that's kind of the second step. I mentioned we planted out several hundred seedlings that we're evaluating. So basically, We'll keep an eye on those and taste them. And if they have good fruit, then um, we'll give them a number and they're put into variety trials. And then after the variety trial has gone on for a few years and they have good fruit, we decide that it's good enough that we want to release it and sell it. Then it's given a name and nurseries sell it. So anything that's like a letter number combination is something that's still in variety trials. Okay, and yeah, somebody said they got some from Tennessee Forestry Service, but they blinked, but they didn't have very good survival rates. Um, so, so can we see, sorry, I didn't see this at the time, previous slide about freezing. So you wanted to see about processing and freezing the fruit. I'll go back to that. So sometimes it popped up on my screen and sometimes it didn't when there were questions. That's the first slide about freezing. That's um, if you want to do it kind of the smaller scale method, more a little bit more labor intensive, but if you don't have a lot of fruit, it's fine. So again, just cut the fruit in half, scoop out the insides with a spoon, and then you can put it. That's using a, a colander, but you can also use a mesh bag and just like squeeze it through the bag and the, the pulp kind of squishes out. So that's the smaller method. And that is the um, food mill that we use. And again, you want to use the pumpkin squash screen and then the great spiral you cut the end off of so it's big enough for the pawpaw seeds to pass through. And 
And yeah, someone asked, can you start pawpaw seeds in a greenhouse to prevent them from getting like damage the first few years? You can, and we do start ours in the greenhouse, um, but they do need some protection from the sun, even in the greenhouse. So we use shade cloth in the greenhouse, or we used to whitewash the greenhouses where you put, um, put kind of a whitewash on the top of the glass. Um, and now we switch to using like shade cloth that's hung over them. Um, but yes, you can start them in the greenhouse, but they do still need some protection from the sun. So I mentioned there's a dwarf pawpaw tree. In some parts of Tennessee, you would probably see that there is something that's called dwarf pawpaw. The fruit are not as good as this pawpaw, but it, there is a different species that's found more in Florida and Georgia and um, Alabama, and I think in North Carolina, and maybe a little bit in Tennessee too that is um, a dwarf pawpaw, that, but the fruit are not as big or as good on it, so. Okay, I think I got to the, the bottom of the questions, but does anybody else have any questions? And I will go to the end where you can see our Thursday thing information and, and website and things like that. So that's something else. If you're interested in pawpaws, you can come in person or you can watch it on Facebook Live, either one. And okay, somebody asked if there's any advantage to hanging meat in the tree. And I've heard that because they're pollinated by flies and beetles. And so the flies are attracted to things, you know, like meat and things like that. So um, I have heard kind of anecdotally or whatever about people hanging meat or roadkill or things like that in the trees and that will attract flies so um you can I mean I would <laughs> I wouldn't want to do it so it depends on if you, if you want to do that or not it will attract flies more flies in that will help pollination I would rather use something like um if you use manure like fresh manure um that will help fertilize, but it'll also attract flies. Or if you fertilize with fish emulsion or something stinky like that would also bring it in, but bring more flies in to pollinate. Um, so things like that, yes, will attract more flies for pollination. 